1966, you, when you meet David Crosby and Stephen Stills for the first time, what's your impression? Sometimes the smallest action that you take can have profound influences on your life. In 1960, late 66, the Hollies were being thrown a party at the, the record company in Los Angeles. <clears throat> there was this kid that came up to us, and he knew every single thing about the Hollies. He had so much, he, he knew more than we did about the Hollies. He was a Stone fan, right? <clears throat> so he's talking to us, and he says to me, what are you doing after the party? And I, you know, with English people, you don't, have, if you ask them a direct question, they get kind of panicky, right? You know? <laughs> and the way we deal with it is turning the question back on the questioner. So I said, well, I don't know, what do you want to do? He says, well, I have these friends, and they're recording down the street, and I wondered if you wanted to go to the studio. And I said, well, who is it? And he said, they're my friends, they're called the Mamas and the Papas. <laughs> now, okay. I'd seen the first album cover. I'd seen what Michelle Phillips looked like. <laughs> so I was interested in going down to the studio. <laughs> when I got there, um, Michelle and Denny and John Phillips were in the studio putting on a vocal track to one of their tracks, right? So I was talking with Cass Elliot. Introduced, you know, it's fine, she knows who I am, everything's good. She says to me, what do you think John Lennon would think of our music? And I said, well, knowing John a little that I do, because I have known John since 1959, right? I said he would probably, probably put you down. He'd probably keep you at arm's length until he felt comfortable <coughs> enough to let you into his circle, which is the way that most people are in the north of England. I look up at Cass and she's crying her eyes out. And I'd only met this woman for 10 minutes, and I'm going, holy shit, what, what, what did I do? I didn't realize that Cass had an incredible crush on John, and the last thing that she wanted to hear was that he may put her music down, right? So anyway, I, I undo that incredible faux pas that I'd already created. And she said to me, as I figured out most of you Americans do, she said, what are you doing after this session? <laughs> I said, I, I don't know, what do you want to do? <laughs> she said, well, I want to introduce you to this friend of mine. His name is David Crosby. I think you'll get on really well. She picks me up at the Knickerbocker Hotel, which is, I think is on Hollywood Boulevard. She drives me up to Laurel Canyon, which is not far from the center of, uh, of town in LA. It's what, 10 minutes if the traffic's good. We go upstairs to this room. It has no furniture. It has a great sound system a guitar, and on this only piece of furniture, which was a couch, which caught, I, I have a series of photographs of Crosby throughout the years, and he's always lying on a couch. <laughs> <laughs> this first day, there he is, right? As he's talking to me, on his chest, he has a shoebox lid. And without losing eye contact with me, He's shaking this lid, and he's separating the grass from the stems and the seed. <laughs> Perfectly. I've never seen anything like that. This, this was new to me. You know, I'm from England, for God's sake. I didn't know this kind of thing went on. Anyway, that was my introduction to Crosby. And he later said, you know, I want you to come to this party at my friend Peter Talk's house. And he had, Peter had a, who was one of the monkeys, and he was a dear friend of, of everyone's. And he said, come on, we're going up to this party. He said, I want you to meet somebody. We go up to Mulholland, knock on the door, it opens, this incredible cloud of smoke comes out of his face, <laughs> right? And there's this guy playing piano, and he's banging the shit out of it in a great way. He's like Brazilian and and Latin, and boogie-woogie, and rock and roll, all, and I'm, I'm listening to this kid, and Crosby's mumbling to me in my ear, and I'm saying, hey, David, I want, I'm listening to this kid. He said, well, if you'll shut up, that's who I want to introduce you to. <laughs> His name is Stephen Stills. And that's how, right? So, a year later, I come from London to Los Angeles to be with John. David and Stephen are at dinner. So we have dinner, 
David looks at Stephen and he goes, play Willie that song. And Stephen and David, in two-part harmony, sing a song that Stephen had written for the first album called uh, You Don't Have to Cry. It's a brilliant song. They get to the end, I say, wow, that's an incredible song, Stephen. You really wrote an incredible song. That's fabulous. Would you do me a favor? Would you sing it one more time? They looked at each other. They kind of shrugged and said, OK, and they did it the second time. They got to the end of it, and I said, OK, bear with me here. Sing it one more time. <laughs> On that third time, I'd learned the words, the melody. I knew what I was going to do. Whatever sound Crosby, Stills, and Nash has was born in 30 seconds. That's how long it took us to harmonize that way. So much so, we burst out laughing in the middle of the song. Because the Springfield and the Birds and the Hollies were good harmony bands. We knew what we were doing. We, we, we'd been making records in harmony for, you know, for years. But this was different. Nobody has any claims on the notes that we sing, but nobody in the world can sound like me and David and Stephen when we join our voices together. Thank you.